fall day, I guess Tracy's type of day. Not mine, a little too cold. <laughs> I liked Monday through Thursday, which was like uh, 80 degrees. So we'll take what we can get, right? Well, they sent me a picture last night <laughs> of them eating in a restaurant, OK? Because I had met Marsha, her good friend, uh, th Tammy's good friend that they're staying with. I met her and her husband last uh, when they came down with me. So. Anyways, good morning. good morning. Wonderful, wonderful day to open the Word of God. And remember, Father, we do thank him, and we want to thank the Father for making us fit to be partakers of the inheritance and grace. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He's translated us already in the kingdom of the dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And for somebody that may be listening, this might be an odd topic today, a lesson that I have. Stop, look, and live. Warning, the life you save may be your own. Did anybody ever hear that? It was a sign that they used to put in dangerous places when you were driving. <coughs> and like people forget to stop at a stop sign that couldn't be seen because it was whatever. So we're going to use that in a spiritual sense. That maybe if somebody's listening today to understand that the only way to be saved is to understand Paul's gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the uh, gospel that Paul said was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ for him to fulfill what he had to do. I have finished my course, he says in Timothy. In Acts, he says that I may finish my course with joy. So we want to remember to stop, look, and live, warning the life is, is, that you save may be your own in a spiritual sense. You have to understand Paul's gospel to be saved. Nobody can be saved by what Peter said at, pa at Pentecost. Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. First of all, people look at repentance lots of time and say it's about a confession. And all repentance is is a change of mind. And sometimes in the Word of God, all you have to do is the first time that that word is mentioned gives you the meaning of the word. So the first time the word repentance is mentioned is in Exodus 13, 17, if you'll turn there, please. And it's very interesting what God says here, because now the children of Israel are going to be able to leave uh, Egypt, and he's concerned that he does not want them to go through a certain place. And notice what he says in Exodus 13, 17. This is the first time the word repent is mentioned. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the, uh, let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, meaning that would be the shortest direction he could take them to get to the promised land. For God said, lest peradventure, or per perhaps, the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So very clearly we understand the word repent from there. It means simply that they change their mind because they don't want to see war and they go back. All that, that's all it means. Now, if we, if we understand then what happened at Pentecost, what Peter was telling them, he wanted them to change their mind concerning the Messiah, this Messiah that they had crucified, that they had killed. So he said, I want, what you're going to have to do to the entire nation, change your mind on who this Messiah, this person Christ is, that he's the true Messiah. He has now been resurrected. Okay, and then you need to be baptized, water baptized, which started, of course, with John. And John made it very clear when he was baptizing someone, he said, I knew him not, but he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore I come baptizing with water. So it was, Israel understood totally what baptism was all about. It was a washing, if you go back into the Old Testament. And very clearly then, they would have understood. And remember when they said to John, they didn't say, what are you doing? They were saying, by what authority are you doing that? Because they understood washings. And they asked him very clearly, what? Who did they think he was? No one? 
Didn't they say, are you Elijah? Because he's the forerunner. And of course, what did John say? No. But what did Christ say? Yes. If you accept what this kingdom message, he is Elijah. So Christ made that very clear. So anyways, that's simply what repent means. You cannot be saved by Acts 2.38. Now, but we understand then in Paul's gospel of the grace of God, it's all counting on the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If a person puts their faith simply in what Christ did at Calvary, his shed blood that takes away all sin, and we put our faith in that completed work, not our work but his, we have that eternal life in Christ. And he became sin for us so that we may be made the righteousness of, of God in Christ. So that's how simple it is. It's a belief thing, okay? Faith is simply believing. Believing is taking God at his word. Now, in light of this, what we did two weeks ago, we started with five things that I say shows very important that we have to understand to see Paul's specific mystery message. The first one is the dispensation of the grace of God. And go to Ephesians, so reviewing just a little bit, go to Ephesians chapter 3. Everybody knows this passage. And if somebody will read verses 1 through 3, I will really appreciate it. In Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 3. And I, I wrote this note because I'm not capable lots of time remembering this definition, so I wrote it at the top of my page. I remember Tracy looked at my Bible once and he said, oh, you're adding to the Word of God because I had all these notes in there, okay? <laughs> I'm not as smart as he is. I have to have notes. Revelation, and the definition I liked was an act or process of disclosing something, okay, previously hidden or obscure, especially something true. And that's what Paul's saying. I've been given a revelation, something that was not known before, that was hidden God since before the foundation of the world. I am now revealing that to you. And he said, that dispensation of, gra of grace has been given to me. No other writer says that. The other thing to remember is, no other writer said that he's the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Paul says, I'm a preacher to the Gentiles, a teacher to the Gentiles, apostle to the Gentiles, a witness to the Gentiles, and a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. He says, I am an ambassador in bonds for the Gentiles. So very clearly we understood that dispensation of grace. And there's three verses. We used a lot of verses, but there's three verses I want to use to show how that grace went from eternity past, that revelation, all the way to the future. So go to 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, please, follow along. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his, talking about God, own purpose and grace. So look at where this grace started, which was given us in Christ Jesus how long ago? Before the world began. Peter says, everything I'm telling you is from the foundation of the world. Paul says, everything I'm telling you has been hidden God since before the foundation of God until God revealed it or Christ revealed it to me from the heavens. So that's where you see the grace started in this wonderful dispensation. Now, what's the present tense of, of what grace is? Go to the next ver chapter in Titus. And look at chapter 2 and verse 11, please. If somebody will read uh, chapter 2 and verse 11, please. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's this wonderful dispensation that has been going on for 2,000 years since we were on the ball. So the grace started in this in clear in eternity past. It's now in the present tense. Salvation now has appeared, and how is it? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. 
Now, everybody knows the future of this program for you and I, and all we have to go is to, to Ephesians chapter 2, and all we have to do is work with verse seven, uh, 7, and this is what he's going to do for us in the ages to come. Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, there it is again, in his kindness towards how? Through Christ Jesus. Wow. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. For we are his, God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ Jesus unto good go uh, works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. And that last part is so important. People that are trying to work their way into be a workman for God have to understand something very specific. You and I cannot be a workman for God until we are God's workmanship. And that's what people don't understand who's work, trying to work their way to salvation. We become a workman for God once we have, been, once we have God's workmanship in Jesus Christ, what he did for us in Christ, giving that righteousness, making us a son of God because of what Christ has done for us. So very clearly... You see three wonderful passages there of grace that goes in this dispensation from eternity past to the present to the future. And that's what the grace is all about. The next aspect we're going to leave, and that's the preaching of the cross. Paul is the first one that uses that term. The next thing we're talking about is then what is the believer's walk because of that preaching of the cross. And we skip those two. We'll go to, this, to the last two, which was Paul makes oaths, which is totally different. He makes a vow and an oath, an affirmation of, the, of what he has been given. And then he talks about his conscience, the good conscience he has. And a conscience is simply a guide to one's behavior. So we looked last week at the vows that Paul said. And why was this very important that I mentioned last week? No other writer had to emphasize this from Paul. Peter doesn't say anything about God is my witness, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, as God is true, and so forth, because Peter very clearly said, I'm not telling you anything new. He says, everything from the prophet Samuel on is what I'm saying to you. It's all what the prophet said. John the, Bob uh, John the Baptist did not have to do that, because he was preaching a message that had been prophesied. All the writers of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were only giving you exactly what the message was concerning prophecy and Jesus Christ according to prophecy. So let's just look at a couple of these vows. Go to Romans 1.9, please. And we did this in our review. And if some, once we get that, if somebody will read that, I will really appreciate it. So that wonderful great epistle, and remember we have always talked, and all of us that have teach have said that, these epistles are not written in the order that Paul wrote them. They're written in the order that the Holy Spirit puts them that's so important. And Romans gives you that full explanation of this wonderful dispensation, understanding the righteousness we have in Christ, understanding all those aspects. So Paul says, for God is my witness. Look at Romans 9, 1, please. I love this verse in Romans chapter 9, 1. And of course, we know the dispensational aspect of 9, 10, 11 as he's talking to his Jewish brethren. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. And there's that next part that we're going to deal with, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So very clear, Paul makes that fear. Go to, go to uh, 2 Corinthians, or... I apologize, I think that's wrong, but I could be right, yes. Go to 1 Corinthians, no, it's probably 2 Corinthians. I do that a lot, I don't know if anybody else that teaches does that, but I'm sorry, lots of time not sure which of the Corinthian books it is, so you have to bear with us, so see if I'm right on that. Yes, 2 Corinthians 1.18, please, 2 Corinthians 1.18. 
But as God is true, but as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. It was yea, he says, if you continue that. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Look at verse 23, right down there, five later. Moreover, I call God for a record, similar to what he says about being a witness, upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Look at 2 Corinthians, the last one. We're not going to look at all of them. Chapter 8, please. And 2 Corinthians 8, 20 and 21, please. 2 Corinthians 8, 20 and 21. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of man. So honest things, vow, this thing. So the beauty of understanding the Word of God, as all of us do, rightly dividing it, and understanding that the whole Bible is for us, but it's not written directly to us, is to understand that simply that Paul having this wonderful new revelation, he is the apostle of Gentiles, he is a preacher of the Gentiles, a teacher of the Gentiles, a witness to Gentiles, and so forth, with his message, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, is Paul's very, uh, saying very clearly here, the things I'm saying to you are honest things. I can vow, I can make a record of this. And no other writer had to do this. Why did Paul have to do this? Very simply, go back to Ephesians. And if you go to Ephesians chapter 3, it's a very simple thing why he had to do this. Because Paul could not go back to Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah or go back to anything that Moses said or any of the prophets or anything that Christ said when he's here in his ministry for a very simple reason. And look at verse eight, uh, verse 8 and 9, please. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Why did Paul say that? Ooh, silence. Oh, is he smart? I'll tell you. Thank you, Keith. Some days. <laughs> Some days he's smart. Yeah, because Paul had a conscience at one time, but the conscience was a very bad conscience. He thought he was doing right. I'm going to bring all these people, these people that believe in Jesus, I'm going to come back and put them in prison, and I'm going to be there to vow that they're going to be killed for that belief. So Paul says very clearly here, that's why. But notice what he says after this. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And what is he to make known then? To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery or the secret, which was from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So if something's unsearchable, and I used other words, untraceable, untrackable, they mean the same thing, then that's why you would have to make vows to say, God is my witness. I say the truth in Christ and lie not. As God is true, because he couldn't go anywhere back to anything else. He said, it's what I've been given as a direct revelation. Peter never had to say this. John never had to say this. Okay? So very clearly that helps us to understand very clearly the next aspect. Paul had to make these vows, these oaths, this affirmation that something special is given to me that is brand new. And if you want to be saved, if you want to stop, look, and live spiritually, the life you may save may be your own. So you better look at Paul's epistles to understand he is our apostle. He has that wonderful message that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. So now on the next aspect, we have to look at why Paul talks so much about his conscience. And this is the key that I put down that I thought at the end is so important. Why? Because holding the mystery in good faith in a good conscience. And that's what Paul is going to emphasize 
to all the people he writes to and to you and I. Let's read it again. That holding this wonderful mystery that he received in good faith, also in a good conscience. So let's look at some of those things. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And if uh, Galen would do a better job of getting 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, I think I could find it. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, I hope I have the right one. And yes, look at 8 and 9, please, if somebody will read that. 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 and 9, and read them very carefully, please. So I changed God's word there, and so I'm going to make sure that I do it right. <laughs> That's what happens when you get old, and that even makes it more important. And that's the verse I used to show how important Paul thought that was. But look at that again. I love that. Likewise must the deacon. So he's talking to how the church should be operated. And we understand there's two categories of people, those that will teach and those that will not. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given by too much wine, and, and not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. A guide to one's behavior. A pure conscience, Paul talks about there. Now, notice... There's also some important things that we have to understand, though. This conscience Paul talks about goes from one believer to another. He talks how important it we are, are that we have a good conscience towards other believers, and that would include all of us in how we conduct ourselves. So let's look at that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and everybody, we have used this passage many times. And Bob, I know you love to read, okay? And you have that wonderful voice that I don't have. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you're going to do a lot of reading here. Will you read 7 through 13, please? 7 through 13, <laughs> seven through 13. <laughs> yes. So Paul, what a wonderful thing that Paul is saying about, it's not a problem eating uh, meat, because an idol means nothing now. An idol did mean something when we're talking about the Jews under the law. That was very important. But Paul said, it makes no difference. You know, whether you eat it. But if I have a weak brother who thinks it is wrong, what am I going to do? I'm not going to eat. That's doing what is so important, thinking of the other believer before ourselves. And Paul constantly was doing that. And that's what he's saying. So this conscience is very important, not just before God and uh, holding this mystery, which is the most important thing, but also a guide to one's behavior when we're dealing with each other. How am I going to put that other believer first? And Paul really emphasizes that. Go to the book of Philippians. And Philippians is such a wonderful little book. 
that says so much for us and look at uh, chapter 2, please. I wasn't even going to go there, but you know, I don't know if I'll ask Tracy and Bob, but all of a sudden something tells you to go somewhere, so I'm not saying God talked to me, <laughs> okay? Careful there. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. I didn't mean it that way, okay? But all of a sudden just something hits you in a verse and say, oh, that might be a good place to go. And I love this passage. So go to Second Corinthians chapter 2. And look at uh, starting in, I hope I have two that I'm looking at. Okay, give me one second, please. Maybe it's not in your new Bible. That could be. <laughs> Oh, see, I did not get the right information as, as, uh, well. <laughs> that could be. <laughs> what, I think you know what he's doing? He said, I think it's good to embarrass Galen right now, okay? <laughs> I'll have him go somewhere that he can't find it. So I do ap apologize, but uh, <laughs> to take it, if somebody, when he talks about, oh, the passage where he's talking about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the passage is right before where he's talking about Christ. Well, he just said verse 3. Right oh, thank you so much, Tracy. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the one. I, went, I was looking at 13, and I wanted 3, so I wasn't too far off, was I? So look at verse 1 of chapter 0. Oh, I thank you so much. I appreciate that as a brother in Christ. You got me out of a, a great jam there. Okay. And look at verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, verse 1 of chapter 2, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels, affections, that is, and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. Now, he answers all four of those things in verse 2. This is how why I love this passage. If there's any comfort of love, he says in verse 1, notice what he says, that ye be what? Like-minded. The second thing he says, if any, uh, okay, if, I'm sorry, if there be any consolation in Christ, you be like-minded. If any comfort of love, have the same love. If any fellowship of the Spirit, okay, being of one accord. If any bowels and mercy, be of one mind. So Paul answers those, uh, verse 1 with verse 2. He says, if, 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 and then I'll give you, be like-minded, having the same mind. Now notice verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. That's not easy to do. It's not easy to do in a relationship of husband and wife and it's not easy to do lots of times because that old nature rears up and it puts us in a spot that's saying I want to be right. I want to be the one. But Paul says this is what we should do. Let nothing be done through vain, a strife or vainglory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He doesn't say you shouldn't look at things of your own, but he said you look at also the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What a wonderful passage. So, knowing what Christ did puts in this position of what he's saying, how we should be conducting ourselves in the body of Christ. And I said once that I might be sort of making too much of this, but never say, I'm going to church. What we should be saying is, I'm going to be with the church because the church is the body of Christ. So this building means nothing. 
to those people in religion, buildings mean something, but to us they're not. We are going to be with the church, which is his body. So very clearly now, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I appreciate that people help me out there. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did someone else hit it first? Oh, oh, I, I didn't hear you. Then I take it back. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. So this Tracy just repeated what you did. I really appreciate that. Then. Oh, okay. Second Corinthians chapter eight. Okay. Oh, we did read that, 20 and 21, right? We did read that. Or no, no. See, I'm way ahead of myself. Okay, let's, let, let's read this again, 19. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and decoration of your ready mind, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administrated by us providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord but also in the sight of God. So in that, in that passage, so when we look at this, what I'm trying to, all these things that we're doing is to show something very important. That when Christ came and said, the kingdom is at hand, it is close. And if they understood prophecy and they understood Daniel's prophecy and all those, realized how close it was for them to have the kingdom and that is a wonderful message but if we go back to that kingdom message and try to live by the sermon of the mount or try to live by the law or especially a passage that is so misused go to matthew chapter 25 In Matthew 25 is a passage that you have a lot of, of denomination call it the social gospel and that you are saved and this is how you have salvation and you can guarantee that you have a life with heaven if you do these things. And what we understand about Matthew 25, it has to do with Christ's second coming and it has to do with his second coming to the earth for that nation when he's going to bring judgment and war. Today it's grace and peace, opposite. Everything's grace and peace, it'll be judgment and war. But when he comes to the Gentile nations, and very clearly he says, I'm giving this message to the nations of Matthew 25, this will be a decision on how you will go into the kingdom, the Gentile nations. And it goes clear back to Genesis chapter 12. When he says to Abraham, he said, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curses you. They'll get a blessing, and Gentile nations always got a blessing, just as the Syrophoenician woman got a blessing, just how Cornelius got a blessing in Luke chapter 8, because of what they looked upon as the Jews, if they understood their position. Cornelius got it because he built them a temple. Okay, The Syrophoenician got it because she understood her position. She said, truth, Lord. I know I'm a dog, but even the dogs take the crumbs from the table of the children. Because Christ says, I come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel to the, that time. So the Gentile nations will come either into that thing on how they treated the nation Israel during the tribulation. So when we look at that, look at, and let's see where we started, want to start here in Matthew 25. Starting in 31, please. When the Son of Man, and what did I remember when we did a series on that? That's a title that is only used when God, when God is dealing with the nation Israel. Paul never uses that term. The Son of Man is something, and no one ever called him the Son of Man when he is here on earth. The only people that ever even mentioned that, the multitude said, Who is this Son of Man? But no one ever called him that, but Christ called him that over 80 times, if I'm remembering when I added up and looked at my concordance, he calls himself that. The first person to ever call him the Son of Man is Stephen. When Stephen says, I look up and I see the opening there in heaven and I see the Son of Man standing, no longer sitting, as Peter says he sees him in Acts 2, sitting at the right hand, he's now standing. Why? 
he sees him coming back to bring judgment and war. So look at 31. And when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. What do we know about when God's dealing with the nations if you go back to the book of Numbers? They were never, what, counted among the nations. They were to separate themselves. And, and Numbers emphasizes that. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, that's the nations that go into the kingdom, but the goats on the left, those that will go into destruction. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, be blessed of my, uh, my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. When? From the foundation of the world. Paul says, what I'm giving you is hidden in God since before the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw ye and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we, we ye sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Well, if Christ came only in the Gospels, in his earthly ministry, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who are his brethren? It can only be Israel. It can't be Gentiles. So very clearly, that's how Gentile nations were to go into the kingdom. Those that helped Israel during that tribulation time will go in. Because if you do not take the mark of the beast, which the true Israelite will not, you will not be able to buy or sell or anything. So by, by misusing this, and there's nothing wrong with that, all these denominations, they have their soup kitchens, they have places where you can get free food, and it doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but it's not going to give you any chance for righteousness to get in there because our righteousness is like filthy rags for the Lord. That would be what you're doing to get into heaven. Doesn't mean it's a bad thing. But remember what we started with. You can't be a workman for God until you are God's workmanship. What he created us in Christ Jesus. When he gives us the righteousness of God in Christ. That gives us that, right, that standing and gives us eternal life. So in closing, as we go, all these t things here. The first thing was that dispensation of grace. Now we have Paul's oath that there's something new that I have to make sure I tell you that God is my witness. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, as God is true and so forth, because I can't go back to the prophets. I can't go to Samuel, because this is brand new. It's unsearchable. And then Paul's constantly saying, your conscience is so important. Not just this is the most important one, holding the mystery in good faith in a pure conscience. Paul says, I did that in the revelation is given. But then he says, it should be important to us on how we treat other believers. And if there's something that you know, it's not bad to eat meat to an idol, but if it's going to make you a weak brother, and you're stronger than him to understand that, you say, fine, I will not eat also. Because I'm going to look at him and look at the things of him before myself. So what we're going down to next week then is to go to the preaching of the cross, and then we'll go to the believer's walk. So we've also already looked at the dispensation of the grace of God and how it's important that that was given to Paul and how he made oaths and vows to prove that. God is my witness. I say the truth in Christ and why not. And he says it constantly over eight or nine times in his thing. And then Paul talks about how important his conscience is. Now, before we close, go to Acts chapter 24. I forgot to do that, so give me a minute. I wanted to do this. In Acts 24 and Acts 26 are two important things. So in Acts 24, he's dealing with Felix, the governor. And the whole key is whether he's going to be sent back to Jerusalem, and of course they would have killed him, or whether he's going to be able to get to Rome, because God has already made that as such important. So if you look at Acts 24, 
And look at verse 16, please. He's dealing with Felix here. And he says, in, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Now, he's speaking to Felix. Now, why is this important? Because Paul could have been given freedom here. Look at verses 21, or 24 through 26, and somebody will read those, please, as we close. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped always also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. I love that passage because Paul could have what? Given him a bribe, and he would have gotten free. But notice, go back to 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense, not only toward God, but all toward mine, because he wasn't going to do that. And Felix is saying very clearly, if he gives me money, I think I'll free him. Okay? <laughs> and that's what a lot of people say. But notice verse 27, because that answers what actually happened to Paul. But after two years, Portius Felix, Festus, excuse me, came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul what? Bound. So we know very clearly Paul did not do that. So we look at that and go to Acts ch chapter 26. And why I'm taking you here, look at verse 9. Notice what a, a Paul thought he had a good conscience before. And notice how he emphasizes that in verse 9 when he's going before uh, Agrippa. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints which I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them, oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad, and all that means is enraged there, against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So you can have a good conscience, there Paul had a bad conscience, but he thought he was doing right before when he was going to persecute those kingdom saints. So it just tells us how important that is to understand that you can also have a conscience that is wrong, even though you might think in your mind, I'm doing the right thing. So very clearly we look at this wonderful man, because not talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, but everybody else, Paul is the greatest man when I look at that ever lived because he gave us this wonderful dispensation of grace that Christ gave to him, and he fulfilled that. He said, I have a mission. I have a course I have to fulfill, and I will fulfill it even unto death. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your precious word. And the five aspects we looked at, we looked at why a special dispensation was given to him, we looked at the vows, the oaths that Paul had to make, that God is my witness, I speak the truth of Christ alone. And, and Paul had a good conscience, not only before God, but before man. And he lived that even unto his death. And next week we'll look at preaching of the, the, preaching of the, of the cross, and we'll look at the believer's walk. We just thank you and praise you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, who gives us that righteousness of God in Christ by putting our faith and what Christ did at Calvary and nothing else. That shed blood that taketh away all sin. We just thank you and praise you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.